private enterprises in Chinese football is, is basically bringing together these two, two hobbies. And uh, so I'm very happy to talk about this today and especially look into private companies and how voluntary driven is China's private football boom. So I want to do this uh, in the next 35 minutes. Uh, first, we, we talk about uh, football in China to give a little introduction of the situation there. And then the football reforms, which kicked off in 2015, which were also broadly discussed in the media in recent years. And then take a closer look at the professional football only, professional football clubs, first, second and third division, and what are the main actors there and what are their constraints and motivations. And maybe we also talk about nationalism. It's definitely a big, big part of all this. Um, so if we talk about football in China, um, I first want to show you this statistic, which is from 2016, but I think it's still quite, quite accurate, um, which shows what's your favorite sports to watch in China. And there you can see basketball is number one with 21% and then followed by football. Um, this, if you also look at, at other statistics, this is always the case, more or less football and basketball being the most popular sports only on TV and media. Um, from time to time, there's like other sports which, which are popular, like tennis in recent years was really popular or esports recently is, is really growing fast. Um, but these two, two sports are, are really the biggest sports, at least in the media landscape or in like public interest. At the same time, I think it's really interesting to, to look at, I don't watch sports at all with 30%. So you can see there's still a really huge group uh, who's not interested in sport at, at all at the moment. So definitely something that could grow in the future. At the same time, these numbers, they change drastically if we look at what sports do you actually part participate in? So there we see football not on second position, more on, I think, seventh position, far behind badminton or running uh, and basketball, again, very popular. So even though there is a huge interest in football in China, um, not really, not many people play football. So this, this, this changed a bit in recent years, especially due to the reforms. But in general, it's still, if we compare it to Europe, it's, it's, uh, completely different situation. It's very not common to, to play football in, in China. It's still quite niche, let's say. Um, the third thing I think that's really important and something that sometimes um, it doesn't look like from the outside, if, if we look at all these big transfers, uh, big players going to China for millions of, of euros, still the football market in China is very immature. Uh, one good example in, in recent weeks was the, the uh, seizing of um, Jiangsu Suning Football Club, first division football club, who was jo just the, the champion like a few, a few months ago and now stopped operating. And uh, Jiangsu Suning was owned by Suning, uh, which is, a, which is um, electronic markets retailer, electronics um, e-commerce also. And uh, they were in financial troubles in, in recent years, especially due to the uh, Corona pandemic. And the first thing they did is stop all their sports involvement. And uh, Jiangsu Suning was their first division club, which they then stopped operating. Uh, they also own Inter Milan in, in Italy, another thing, uh, another club they want to sell at the moment, or at least sell shares of it. So this really shows you this market in China is still very immature and clubs highly depend on investors' money. If the, if the investor has problems financially, uh, the club also has problems. I will talk about this later in, in, in more detail, but um, this is really one, one big problem at the moment that the market is not there yet and, and clubs really have problems to finance themselves and make money from football itself. So they really rely on the, on the business of their investors and on the uh, money of the investors. Uh, this wants to be, this should change in the future. China wants to become the biggest sports economy in the world by 2025. Um, and football should be the main pillar of this. I will later talk about the football reforms in more detail. Um, so it's really, yeah, something that's, that should be changed. But right now the, the sports industry, especially the football market is really unbalanced and, and far from mature. 
And lastly, I want to show you China's sporting performance, actually. Uh, this is only the, the men's national team world ranking. Um, so basically the ranking of all countries in, in global football in China at the moment this is on position 75 between Syria and the Emirates. So really not too football nations, I would say. Um, and it really shows that China yeah, in, is, is far from their aspirations in, in regards to football, even though in, in other Olympic sports, they're among the top two, three nations at the moment or for the last yeah, 10 to 20 years already, I have to say. Um, but in football, they're, they're far behind from what they want to achieve. But this is something China wants to change. So in 2015, uh, Xi Jinping or, or the central government in China um, issued several policy papers at, at highest um, political levels, uh, which are now known as the Chinese football dream. Uh, quite, quite nice name the media picked for this. Um, and the main goal of this is to become a football, a leading football nation until 2050. Here, the main focus is really on the national team, um, but still the, the club football, so football clubs in China, they should be the breeding ground for, for Chinese talents and should feed into the national team. But still the main focus above everything is, is to have a strong national team. Um, and how they wanna do it, um, there were, there's different parts of these reforms. They're really large scale uh, implemented all over the country. Most parts really top down. Um, so the central government is, for example, had the plan until 2020 to establish 20,000 football schools all over the country. This was implemented from top down and was then implemented by local governments. Um, at the same time, there were lots of reforms inside the governing bodies of, of football and so on and so on. So lots of stuff going on. Uh, what I want to look today in, in more detail is more the, the part of marketization or commercialization of the sport. So what I said before, it's, it's really an immature football market at the moment in China. And there's definitely something that China wants to change to have a, have a mature football market, to have a football market that makes money actually and uh, makes enough money to, to um, yeah, let these football clubs operate sufficiently and, and also then, be, as I said, be the breeding ground for, for local talents. And here, the way of implementing these reforms was a bit different, so not so much top down. It was more in the center, we had these reforms which were kicked off in 2015. Um, with the with a great goal to become a football nation until 2050. <clears throat> and what was planned is to motivate private firms, state firms, and local governments. So these three actors here to basically jump on the train and, and help with this with this policy and help with these reforms. Um, and at the same time, the government tries to initiate uh, cooperations between these different actors. So what I do um, today and also in my PhD is more look really just at professional football clubs, so really the highest level of, of, of club football. And uh, there we see these three actors again being, being highly, being, being strongly involved in, in these reforms. So if we only look at um, the club owners and their goals at the moment in China, we have these three groups again. Um, so state firms very often investing in football clubs or owning football clubs. One example here I picked is Shanghai SIPG or now Shanghai Port, I think they're called. Recently, there's lots of name, name changes in, in, in China, which is the port operator of the Shanghai city. So the Shanghai municipal government is the owner of this state company, which then owns the club. Uh, something that's yeah very very uncommon uh, in in Europe I would say but very common in China at the moment around thirty percent of all football clubs are not privately owned so they're like either state owned or later I will talk about like local governments or or local football associations even owning clubs and in a very like let's say uh, simplified um, way of talking about their goals I want to show. Um, mostly these state firms, because they belong to the state, they really follow political goals. 
So their goal is as well to become a leading football nation until 2050 and help uh, with, 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 their, with their club to achieve this. And at the same time, very often also to yeah, receive recognition within the state and show, okay, we're helping with this, with this goal uh, to become a football nation. And um, so these are the two main goals. As I said, this very simplified way of looking at things, but I think it illustrates it quite well to see the differences in the different actors involved in football in China. The second biggest group, which is at the moment the biggest group in, in football in China, which around uh, which have like around 70% of all football clubs are private firms investing in football clubs. Here on the right side, we can see the, the logo of Guangzhou Evergrande Taobao FC, or now Guangzhou FC, which as the name says, is owned by Taobao, China's biggest e-commerce company and Evergrande, one of the biggest real estate companies in China. So these two companies, they jointly own, own um, right now China's biggest football club and uh, yeah, help also uh, participate in the, in, the, in the first division. Uh, on the left side, we see the logo of Beijing Guan, uh, which is in mixed ownership, I would say. They're partly owned by Sinobo, which is again, private real estate company and CITIC, CITIC is a state company in the finance business. Um, so we also see these mix, uh, mixed ownership forms um, in club football, same as in Chinese, in the Chinese economy in general. And their goals are very different. Um, they are very often focused on advertisement. So Sinobo uh, wants to yeah, advertise themselves with, with being involved in Goan. Uh, they very often hope for a return and invest, uh, at least in the future, where they want to make money with, with this football club. And lastly, and which is the main focus of my research, is uh, yeah, improve relationships to the government, improve their, their relation to the government. And the last group are like local governments, local football association, but also universities, colleges, etc., who are involved in football clubs here, for example, Major Hacker, I think, which is owned by the Football Association in Majo. And they have similar goals like the state firms, so especially political goals to become football nation uh, and yeah, inner state recognition, I would say. And these Clubs, they, they participate uh, in, in, in the various leagues in China, first, second, and third division. And they have, as I said, different goals. And these goals very often they clash with each other. And uh, a state, a club which is state owned, has completely different goals to a club that is privately owned. So, this is uh, one example where we could see the clash of interests, let's say. This was like, I think, two years ago at the end of the season, but the season was still on. Um, the Chinese FA, I think, asked about 50 youth players, like, um, but who, who would play in the in the in the um, professional football clubs to go on a like army camp for one month, which of course wasn't so popular uh, among most football clubs, I would say, because they needed these football players in their team. The season wasn't done, um, so there was lots of, yeah, of course, protest among fans. Not all, not always so public. But still, there you could see uh, this clash of interests. So the, the Chinese Football Association wanted to have these 50 youth um, players to yeah, go on a training camp, basically, army style. Um, and the clubs, of course, needed them in their clubs. Another example, which I found very interesting, is, is a really recent example, I think, from two days ago. This is the chairman of Shanghai SIPG. So the, this port uh, from Shanghai, who owns also um, the local football club, he said um, in a press conference to announce the, the squad for the, for the new season, the Chinese national team stands over club interests. So very openly saying what we're doing is always behind the national team. Um, the priority is on the national team. Even though, of course, as a club, they want to compete, they want to win the league, um, but still what's important is send the players to the national team and, and create a strong national team. And the third example, which comes from a private um, club, this is the you this is not Disneyland, this is the Youth Academy of um, Guangzhou Evergrande, I think one of the biggest academies in the world. 
um, one club that really stands out with how it, even as a private company or as a private club, really supports these these reforms. Um, the club openly says we want to we want to support the national team. We want to create an all Chinese team. Many teams they rely on on foreign players, um, but their goal is soon to have an all Chinese team. They paid, I think, 75% of the national coach salary a few years ago, something that's also really interesting, I would say, uh, something that probably uh, wouldn't happen um, in, in Europe, uh, where, where like a club is paying parts of the salary for the national coach and so on. But this really, really, again, shows you we have a league with uh, clubs with different backgrounds, with completely different interests and you cannot say oh just because it's a private company they will follow their private interests very often they also follow let's say rather state interests um why is that um i think one good example uh, which which illustrates it quite quite well is the fact um that there's a high concentration of real estate companies in Chinese football at the moment. If we only look at the first division, I think 12 out of 16 clubs are owned by real estate companies, mostly private. Um, and this, if we if we go down a second, third division, this, this is a bit less, but still we have around 50% of all professional football clubs at the moment in China being owned by real estate companies. And this really shows you what's, for many clubs, not for all, but for many clubs, what's behind all this. Um, so I, I, I did this little illustration here, let's say, uh, which, which makes it quite easy to understand. I think here again, this is really simplified. I'm not saying this happens with all clubs, but this happens with many clubs. Um, so what we see is investment for so-called political cap capital, um, where we have the Chinese economy, which is from many scholars, scholars described as a state capitalist economy, uh, with one point being very important in China, the state holds the monopoly over land and capital. Two resources that are extremely important, of course, for real estate companies. So what we see in recent years, especially since the, since the reforms uh, being kicked off in 2015 is as I said, in 2015, the, the, the goal was, okay, we want to become football nation until 2050. So what happened, lots of real estate companies bought or invested uh, clubs. Very often these clubs were not really uh, a good business model, let's say. Uh, most clubs in, in China at the moment, they're, they're loss making, they don't, they don't generate, generate any profits. Um, but this wasn't the main goal, or it wasn't the main motivation of many real estate companies. The main motivation was more to receive favorable treatment uh, from the government for the core business, which is real estate. In China, as I said, monopoly over land and capital. So these local governments in China, they um, decide who, get who gets land and who not. Um, so very often, this local government would then favor the company that was investing in the local football club and would uh, give them land rights, the needed land rights. Another thing that's um, enforcing all this or making it even, uh, yeah, this whole development uh, even faster is the so-called cater ev evaluation system. Another uh, thing that's in place in, in the Chinese government, um, which basically says every four to five years, the, the, the government officials in China, they rotate their position and to get promoted and to get to a better position, there's different criteria you have to fulfill. And football, especially since it's so high on the political agenda, agenda um, is, a, I would say, a soft factor that's, that's getting more and more important also for local officials. So these local officials, they, they try to get recognition from, from higher local uh, from higher officials in the government and then hopefully get the promotion with them also again showing here we, we have this football club now um, the problem with this is very often this is this is short-term thinking it's it's as i said these these cadres they often rotate every four to five years so what they look is what they want to is to to show something within these four to five years once they rotated their position, uh, maybe the football club is not important anymore. 
um, and, and they will stop altogether. Or what they also do is they try to attract uh, football businesses, let's say, and would very openly go to, to um, local companies and ask them to invest or build a football club in their uh, locality. So this was a very broad overview of what, what's going on at the moment, uh, especially looking at, at the um, professional football clubs. In general, as I said, the, the, the reforms kicked off in 2015 and we can already see there's like a few trends in these, in these five years. Um, so something that's really on the positive side, I would say, or what China really succeeded to create in this very short time is, is yeah, a, a football boom. Um, football is way more popular than before, way more people play football everywhere. It's like uh, football pitches being built, football um, schools being built. Uh, lots of clubs uh, got founded in recent years, I think, uh, at the moment, about 50% of all clubs are being were founded after 2014. So you can see it's really a new business where lots of money is, is floating in. After 2017, so like two years after reforms, this slowed down a bit. And also recently, we can see that it's really slowing down. And there's uh, what I would call like a consolidation. Uh, where people try to look more like sustainable and then don't burn so much money like in the first years where there was really yeah lots of very unsustainable investments in football um, but in general China really created this boom and this boom is is very much also privately driven um, the reasons why this is I just explained at least in part um, Still, they succeeded to get very big private companies on board. Let's say Wanda is a good example, Evergrande, Fosun, a few other like really big players who are now involved in football and, and supported like financially on a very big scale. Um, in general, they, they, there's, it's still ongoing, um, like building structures in the football governing bodies, like league structures and so on, but also infrastructure is really impressive what's going on there in, in very short time. So the base is, is basically being laid at the moment. And in general, we can see that China is more globally, way more globally connected than before. Uh, I think at the moment, uh, almost half of all uh, FIFA sponsors are Chinese. Um, lots of sports global marketing agencies are now in Chinese hands. Lots of European clubs are in Chinese hands and so on and so on. Uh, we have the Asian Cup uh, being held in China, I think, in 2023. Uh, we have the Club World Cup being held in China, I think, next year. But now they postponed it again uh, due to COVID. But anyways, we, we see there's more and more like of this global football community being connected with China, something that was definitely not the case 10 years ago. On the down, downside, something I wanted to uh, describe with these uh, few examples I had is really the tension between the different goals of the state, especially the central government, then the league, which wants to have her own strong league, which is competitive and co commercially um, sustainable. And then we have the clubs, which which come from these three groups of actors and everyone has like different goals in itself. Um, so yeah, this is really complex and leads to lots of tension um, in, or has led to lots of tension in recent years. Um, then we can see that even though the state is generally supporting football and this, this whole development of football, it really favors certain, certain companies and certain clubs and others just dissolve and, and, and we're not supported. Um, then, as I said, it's very this short term looking uh, over long term goals. So very often youth academies are really being neglected by football clubs, while at the same time, short term goals like building a great new stadium or buying this, this star player from Europe um, has been main focus in recent years, even though the base is still not at place yet. So like youth structures with really having a, a football base with lots of people uh, and also football culture, lots of people playing the sports is, is uh, still lacking. And uh, lastly, um, we see this strong um, 
a dependence on investors and if the investors is not there then the state and if the state is not supporting you the, the club will just uh, disband and dissolve altogether um, something we saw in recent years uh, extremely often i think last year we had like around 14 clubs uh, disbanding uh, dissolving altogether this year we already have six with the current champion being very prominent um, this is something that, that really shows you once the investor is in trouble or once the investor has no interest in, in further supporting this club because he has what he wanted, um, then it's very, in, it's very likely that the club won't exist um, in the future. And I think where we're going to go in the, in the future uh, shows you this um, quote which is also very uh, a, a recent quote i think two days ago three days ago this is the cfa president so the chinese football association president who said those who can afford to play in the csl are big enterprises the chinese football market is not sound precisely because it is, it is not sound enough more enterprises need to have a sense of social responsibility treating football as a service to the public so he realizes, uh, or everyone in, in, in the Chinese football market realizes, there is no money at the moment. It's really not a, it's not a mature market. And uh, what, what he hopes for is more private companies in investing in football anyways as some kind of so service to, to society. Uh, in how much they are triggered, in how much they are doing this voluntarily is, is another question, but this really shows you there is this, yeah, Asking, asking private investors to invest in football, even though at the moment it doesn't really make sense for most of them. Um, and then on the other hand, another trend we see in, in, in recent two, three years is more and more the state jumping in again and running football clubs directly with their state uh, enterprises. So this is something they in the beginning wanted to go away from, I would say, and now it's, it's basically going back and having a stronger control. Probably something also we, we can see in the overall economy in China, whereas there's more macroeconomic control by the state. Um, yeah, so I think I wanna leave you with this quote because I really like this. And um, thank you. <laughs>